Can I have a uh, motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second. Think you want to open up the voting? Okay. 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 Go ahead. I'll figure that out. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Could you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We're going to start tonight with public input number one. There are laminated rules on everybody's seat. The summary of it is any group or organization wishing to address the board must identify a single spokesperson. Speakers will have up to three minutes. Speakers will address remarks to the president. Speakers will conduct themselves in a civil and respectful manner. Speakers will not address personnel or students. If a speaker wants to speak a second time, they may speak at public input too. The board president has the right to discontinue public input at any time. So at this point, at this time, I'm opening up public input number one. There is a signage paper um, at the top for your first and last name. Could you please print it? Is there anybody for public input number one? Okay. Uh, Scott, do I have anybody online? Okay. Um, next item is president's comments. Um, I have two things to address this evening. Um, we have heard everybody complain about being on Zoom and not being able to hear speakers or hear us properly. So as you can tell, we're a little closer. The microphone's a little closer, so we're doing our best. We're going to tweak it until we can get it right so that it is heard through Zoom and in public um, properly. So bear with us on that. Um, number two, I would like to speak about the Sag Harbor Historical Museum, who came to us probably during midsummer about possibly going into our budget line item as the whaling museum is, as the park is. And of course we collect the taxes for the library. The Board of Education went and we got to see the wonderful um, exhibit on the park, which was fabulous. We all got to go into that. And they are requesting to go on our May 17th vote as a separate light item that will be voted on by the public. And if it is approved, they will go into our budget and we will collect the taxes and then give them back to them. So basically all we are is collecting their tax, their money and then giving it back to them. This for me is um, is very important. It's definitely a part of the historic history of Sag Harbor. Um, it goes back to Mrs. Sage. It does a lot of good stuff for our students. Um, there's never a fee to go to any of their functions, whether it's a Jack or Lantern um, at Halloween or the Christmas caroling and eggnog. It's always free to the public. Um, the um, the park exhibition, which was done last year, which was amazing, was open every Saturday and Sunday for anybody to just be able to walk in and see, which I think is a big part of it. So the board has been in discussions and I know that we're in agreement of this, but tonight I wanted to start the process to um, get the information out to the public um, to understand what the second proposition is going to be for. So tonight, I believe they have a representative. Zach is going to give a quick presentation. Zach, if you could just come up to the... Um, to the podium and um, speak with us. Welcome. Well, great. Thank you so much for inviting us here. Uh, my name is Zach Skudnaroth. I'm uh, the vice president of the uh, museum. And as I guess you all know, we uh, did amend our charter with the state ed department to reflect that we are in fact a museum and not a society. Uh, we're basically both, but uh, we not only own, uh, own the uh, Annie Cooper Boyd House, uh, which is a wonderful early uh, 18th century period 
house here in town, one of the very few. Uh, we determined that through scientific testing a few months ago to confirm the date of construction. And so uh, that house uh, holds our wonderful collections, uh, primarily the paintings of Annie Cooper Boyd, who chronicled the landscapes and the streetscapes here in town around the turn of the century about 100 years ago. So we have that wonderful collection, over 300 pieces of her paintings. And so we're tasked with collecting these objects and then most importantly, educating, uh, whether it be the students, the local families, the community. And so that's what our primary focus is. Uh, we fulfill that mandate with giving tours to students and uh, to families. One exciting aspect, it is to me, Leneva, uh, as a new member to the board, uh, is my interest in the uh, historical burying ground. Uh, we're working with the village, which owns the site, uh, to develop tours and to restore the site. And we see this as a potential place for students to learn about local history. As you know, we have several teachers on our board mm -hmm. uh, who are very busy giving tours. I've joined with the idea in part to develop the educational aspect of the burial ground, in which obviously most of the pe people who lived here, who are people of interest and note that we talk about, are still there in yes. spirit, if, if not actually. Uh, so that's a very wonderful potential educational uh, avenue that we want to pursue. Uh, we're also going to be working with the students. We hope this this year on a book that will chronicle the Architectural Review Board, which is now in its 50th year. And we want to celebrate that. We think it has accomplished many wonderful uh, uh, objectives, primarily that of preserving a historical architecture here in the village. Uh, so we want to generate a book. Uh, that will discuss the evolution of, of that board. Uh, and we're hoping that the students will assist us with taking all the photographs. There will be a couple hundred of those in the book uh, and perhaps some sketches, et cetera. So it'll be a fun collaboration between the museum and the school. Uh, so that's pretty much it. We're looking forward to potentially expanding. If we have this financial support, we can undoubtedly expand our staff, if only part-time and therefore expand programs. So Great. that's pretty much what we're about. We're here to answer any questions. Great. Does anyone on the board have any questions? Um, I think it looked great when we visited, and it seemed that yeah. you had a lot more artifacts that maybe you haven't had the resources to be able to sort we, through and, and share with the public. We haven't, although we have a very ambitious plan now to actually construct an archival facility in the backyard. We have a whaleboat, a reconstructed whaleboat shop, mm -hmm. which is really the only multi-purpose space that we have on the, on the grounds. Uh, so we can do student programming there, but with an additional small building of that type, we can store our archival our paper, our paintings, et cetera. And you can imagine if any of you live in an old house, uh, they're kind of leaky, they get a little wet, our climate is not conducive to maintaining paper objects in a stable environment. So that little building will give us that uh, storage capability. We can take things out of the attic, out of the bureau drawers, et cetera, and have them stored properly, uh, which is obviously our, our mission, our mandate to, to do that. So that'll help us open up the house a bit and uh, have it less cluttered, which okay. you might have noticed when you were there to visit. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a comment. I was trying to say thank you for coming. Yes. And then I just more direct towards us. I just, I would like to see us as a school district try to incorporate Sag Harbor history a little more into the curriculum. We live in this community so rich in all this history and, and things that happened when the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812 were happening right here. And it'd be right. great for our kids to learn more yep. about that. And I think Absolutely. having the society slash museum right, yep. right here is a great opportunity to do that. So I hope we'll, we'll look for ways to do that. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? That's our purpose. And Jennifer? You'll be working with our attorney to work on the of the bridge. So then we'll probably um, be able to present something at the next meeting. Okay. So we'll have our, our full proposition by the next meeting for the uh, for it to be on. Great. Great. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank Pleasure you. To be here. We look thank forward you. to working with you. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, superintendent's report. Uh, thanks, Sandy. So I just want to. Uh, to touch on two topics uh, this evening. The first is 
Uh, of course, yeah, I just don't yeah. know that they do. You guys don't have to listen to this if you want to go. <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay, but. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to provide a quick update on uh, Mass Ash and Mewitt Park and Marsden because they're somewhat intertwined. So for those of you who don't remember, we were scheduled in the fall to go out with a renovation a bond referendum for Mass Ash and Mewitt Park, where basically we were gonna ask the community um, for money to renovate the park uh, and make it um, more suitable for our athletes, safer, um, those types of things. When Marsden um, came on the table as an opportunity, uh, and we were, uh, we announced that we had gone to contract on the fifth lot. We said it would be prudent at that time to hit pause on uh, the Mass Ashenewit Park referendum. Um, but we made it clear that we intended to move forward at some point uh, when we finalized Marsden with a renovation plan for Mass Ashenewit as well. So this past week, um, I did meet with the negotiating committee from the park board. Uh, the focus of that meeting was really two primary areas. One was to invite company reps to specialize in a structured grass system that was made is made up of 91% natural grass and 9% uh, synthetic uh, grass of which that 9%, about 90% of it is uh, subsurface below the surface. And they presented, uh, the company did to the MASH Park Negotiating Committee, uh, their product, as well as a state-of-the-art drainage system. Um, and the second purpose of our meeting was to fo focus on renovation options, because what we said to the public was, with the possible acquisition of Marsden, we had to revisit the scope and scale and cost of what we ultimately decided to do uh, at MASH Park. So there were five uh, renovation plans that we reviewed with them, uh, all different um, in scope and related costs. So those were the, the two areas we discussed. Um, with regard to Marsden, the second community forum, a letter went out to the community on the 18th of January, and that community forum is scheduled for Wednesday the 25th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, in this room in the library and we're going to talk about a few different things um, we're going to review with company representatives the 100 percent natural grass option the 91 percent natural grass option i think it's the opinion of this board after listening to the community um, and really looking at the vote and over the last few months we have decided that for the time being, we're gonna take 100% synthetic turf off the table and focus on the structured grass, which is the 91% option, as well as 100% natural grass. Obviously on Wednesday night, um, the benefits of the 91% option in terms of usability uh, and environmental impact will be explored in more detail. So I won't talk about that last uh, more right now, but um, there's some, Pretty exciting, innovative ideas out there um, that we're looking forward to talking about more on Wednesday. Um, as well, on Wednesday, the architects will provide a brief uh, review of possible uh, simple bathroom and comfort station plans. We're not talking anything elaborate or in scope. It's just a small building that would include a bathroom and maybe a a small concession stand where you know you could get hot chocolate in the winter or something like that. And then um, I asked the architects to touch upon uh, parking surface uh, options and related lighting considerations, all geared towards being uh, good neighbors and being very cognizant of some of the concerns that uh, some of our neighbors have uh, brought to our attention. Um, so we're gonna talk about that on, on Wednesday. Yes. 
Great. Um, principal's report tonight, Mr. Malone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Malone, the elementary principal. And you remember at um, the last principal's report that I gave, I mentioned we were restarting the elementary swim program. And I'm happy to report that our first round was great success down at the East Hampton YMCA. Our fourth grade classes went three times. And um, I think the, the program restart is, is off to a great beginning. Clearly, this is a chance to get children in the um, swimming pool facility at the YMCA and get them exposed to that lifelong activity. But I think the most important piece of the program is that students who cannot swim and are not safe in or around the water, um, we have an opportunity to identify those children. So of the approximately 70 students that attended with our fourth grade, about seven or 10% um, were identified as needing some additional support. They received that during this short experience and we're now in touch with their families to set them up with some um, swimming lessons, whether it be right now or, or in the summer ahead. So I uh, just wanted to update the board on that. Um, we're right at just about the midpoint of the school year. So, um, you know, we're very busy with the current school year, but we as administration always have an eye ahead to the future where we have to plan for next school year. Um, and part of that at the elementary level are welcoming the new families into the fold. So our pre-K program and kindergarten program will be offering orientations in early March. On March 1st, our pre-K parents, our new pre-K parents will be invited to the learning center. That's Wednesday, March 1st at 6.30. And then the following week on Wednesday, March 8th, we'll invite um, kindergarten parents to the elementary school, share details about the program, tour the building, give them an opportunity to meet the teachers and hear about the program. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Mullen. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Brittany Carrier, Pearson Middle High School principal. As I mentioned before, probably some of the repeats, we had an excellent spirited spirit night. <laughs> Kudo, you are um, athletic director, first time doing it since the pandemic. And I think it was one of the best we've ever had. Um, and with the pep rally we did in the during the academic support, where students had to dress up in the whale costume and shoot baskets in a relay, which was excellent and also fun to watch as the mascot head would fall off their heads. <laughs> um, and thank you to our Sag Harbor Booster Club for hosting the event. It was the first time, I think, from the pandemic that was a really, even though we're still living in it, um, a time for our community to come together and see old and new faces. The middle school musical is this weekend, so we are excited to put on Beauty and the Beast. Um, the students that probably what you hear a little bit of noise, out white noise outside. They are busy practicing and getting ready for their dress rehearsal right now. The play times are Friday at 7 p.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., and Sunday at 2. If you want tickets, you can call the main office or stop down and talk to Ms. Galanti. We are busy preparing for the uh, beginning of next year by doing scheduling. So this is where the time of year where our students meet with our guidance counselors, as well as in our administrative offices, working closely with our counselors, figuring out how many um, sections we need of everything, as well as finalizing the schedule. And then to add on to the Historical Society um, presentation, Mr. Solo, Ms. Cataletto, myself, and Zach met in the beginning uh, mid-fall to talk about the 50-year um, booklet of the historical houses and Ms. Cataletto's photography class as well as the Rudishan Trust will be hopefully putting that together with the Historical Society. So that's just one cool way um, we can work with the community and our students can feel a part of the community. So, Great. Thank you. Ms. Bashimi. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm gonna just provide a quick update on the HVAC project that we re redid out. 
So on December 19th, um, I did give the board an update about the uh, the proposed project. We were going to replace all the unit ventilators within the district this summer. And um, back in December, we opened up the bids and the bids came in much higher than the original budget. So at that meeting, it was decided that we would go ahead and rebid the project. We would re reduce the scope significantly and um, we would try and just use our grant allocation, which is about $650,000. Um, and we would try to get at least $650,000 worth of work done this summer, um, collect that money from our grants, and then any future work, we would wait till you know things slow down in the economy and prices, um, you know, inflation wasn't as high as it is now. So we rebid the project out and we did reduce the scope and our lowest bidder still came in at around 880000 so what we had three bids this time, and um, we basically um, had the architect come and do a summary for the committee, um, the Educational Facilities Committee on that Wednesday, and just to give everyone a summary that he was going to try and work with the contractor to see whether or not the scope could be reduced a little bit more, um, either doing less unit events in both buildings or maybe just focusing on doing some unit events in one building versus the other. So we would work with the contract to see where he could cut costs just so that we could be within budget. So the contractor did agree that he would do that and that he needed a few days to work it out, to work his numbers out. And um, he said that uh, he would get back to us sometime this week. So we're hoping to um, come to some sort of agreement on the number and the number itself came in significantly lower. I think the last time we bid it out, they were coming in at like $60,000 per unit event. And um, this time around, I believe they came in at around 42,000, which was definitely better, but not great. Originally the budget was um, planned using a, using a $20,000 uh, per unit cost. So we are going to, um, Speak with the with the contractor. We're going to draw up a contract that would just include work for the six hundred fifty thousand, and then um, we're going to send some information out to the board as soon as we have everything drawn up, and then we're going to try and get this all done by the next meeting, February sixth. Because if we can award the contract, that'll still give us enough time for him to order whatever he needs to order, and still hopefully get, um, if not all the work, most you know a good portion of the work done during the summer. Um, the six hundred fifty thousand is made up of two grants. Uh, two hundred fifty thousand of that expires in September, and the other four hundred thousand expires next September. So even if we just get the two hundred fifty thousand worth of work this year, for some reason, if there's some supply chain issue, um, we can still go ahead and get the other work done um, later in the year. So that was my update for. Alex um, yeah, has a question. Oh yeah. I don't understand that. So <laughs> the. I thought that some of the grant for the 250000 all the work has to be completed by September. The $250,000 of the work has to be, so I had a slide the last time showing the grant expiration date. So the 650000 is made up of two grants, $400,000, $250,000. $250,000 is expiring September 30th, 2023. And the $400,000 is expiring September 30th, 2024. So well, what we if have you, to what get... If you, sign the agreement and then they don't finish the work by September 30th. Well, they would have to complete $250,000. Is that going to be a contingency so in the contract? If, if this, it's definitely going to have some, some deadlines within the contract that they at least get part of the work. There's going to be a deadline and saying we're not going to pay unless it's done. Because I don't, to me, it's late January already. Um, so well, if, if they if this is not possible, then we are not going to enter into a contract. I mean, if we're um, if so, they can't agree to at least yeah. get because this I, is really I think, probably like yeah, I think I think the answer is to work with council is to make sure that the language is such that uh, payment that there's some type of penalty that makes the district whole if it's not done. Okay. Yeah. That's what you're asking for, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, I don't want to seem it's kind of tight already. You know, we, we get at least six of them replaced. So if we can get six of them replaced, you know, by the end of the summer, we'll be fine. If we can't, then we're not going to, yeah. you know, we won't enter into the contract. So, so we'll forward that. We'll forward that to the board before we move forward. Okay. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, that was that. Now we're going to start with our first budget presentation for the season. And we're going to talk about 
the largest portion of budget tonight. And that is salaries and benefits. We're also going to go over the budget for the uh, Board of Education, the district office, the business office, debt service, and transfer it to other funds. So just to remind everyone, our current year budget is $45,993,327. Our property tax levy limit for the current year was 2.73%. Um, we're already working on projections for next year, and the levy limit is going to be much higher. Uh, our tax levy increase this year was 2.5%. Now, that 2.5% was the increase on the levy, but if everyone looks at their tax bill, they'll see that the tax rate actually did not increase anywhere near that um, because the best value increased in both the town of Southampton and the town of East Hampton. The Southampton uh, tax rate actually decreased by 0.03%. And the East Hampton tax rate increased by 1.09%. So if you have a house and your assessed value did not increase, then you really did not see anywhere near 2.5% um, increase to your school taxes. Uh, the tax levy is uh, $41,333,873. And we have roughly $4.6 billion of that um, other funding. It com comes to us through state aid and additional revenue that we collect, mainly because of uh, tuition and also shared services for transportation. And then we do appropriate fund balance every year to support the budget. So that's the difference between the tax levy and the current year budget. And our budget to budget increase mirrored our tax levy increase this year. So it was 2.5% budget to budget increase, and our tax levy increase was 2.5%. This year, we are projecting a higher budget to budget increase, um, but our tax levy increase will probably be um, much lower, just because we do have re we do have additional revenue items that we are projecting already for next year. So salaries and employee benefits. So for the current year, salaries and employee benefits make up eighty one percent of the current year's budget, and we are projecting for next year that salaries are going to increase a little. Um, you're going to, it's going to increase by $346,000, a 1.34% increase on salaries. And our employee benefits budget is going to increase significantly more. Um, we're looking at over an 8% increase to employee benefits, mainly being driven by health insurance. And we'll show you what the health insurance rates have been um, doing and how they've been increasing significantly the past few years. So for next year, um, if you combine both salaries and, and benefits, you're projected to increase by a little of $1.2 million and 3.46%. So our projected salaries, um, our, our salary budget, the detail that we sent you on Friday, um, includes all current staff, which are moved forward into next year's budget. All of the contractual Step and salary increases are based on current contracts and all the contracts are currently settled, which made budgeting for next year a lot easier. Um, going into this current year, there were a couple of contracts that were unsettled, so we had to make sure that we were able to budget some contingency in the budget for that. Um, all unaffiliated staff that are not part of a bargaining unit, their current salary is rolled forward and there is some contingency built in for salary changes um, for, those, for those staff members since future increases or adjustments are usually um, done after the budget is adopted. Uh, Co-curricular and athletic stipends are based on the current teacher contract. And there were funds added for some additional appointments that weren't included in the current year, and also some postseason play. Uh, substitutes, extra pay, overtime, lunch duty, tutoring, lane changes, changes in assignment, um, they were all analyzed and reviewed, and they were increased based on historical spending trends also. So this is what the salaries look like from year to year. And this is broken down into department and this is sorted from highest to lowest with the highest being instruction and the lowest being security. So our current year budget, um, you can see, is in the third column. And um, we are projecting the dollar change at the 1.359%. Um, and yeah, hope that's work. Okay, so you can see I have the, the changes 
right here in the fourth column, and we're going to go through all of these changes individually and talk about um, why we see these increases and decreases, because everyone, as I said, was moved forward, all of our current staff, and um, most of the staff in their contracts, they were entitled to some sort of step or salary increase. So the instructional budget, which includes many areas, teachers, TAs, guidance counselors, nurses, um, everyone paid out of an instructional budget code that's not considered special education is included in that in that line item. Um, right now, when we worked on a projection, we saw this decrease and it came from several different uh, reasons. So one of the reasons was we actually had five teachers retire um, this year, so at the end of last year. So those five teachers made up a big difference with um, the five teachers being at top step and then the new teachers coming in at a, at a much lower step. So that was a big, um, that was a big decrease in the budget. Um, another reason why the salary, uh, that budget item didn't move up is because we reallocated the AD salary also. So you'll see um, in athletics, you'll see an increase of about 102,000 and the majority of that increase is because the, um, Athletic director historically was paid out of athletics and then he was paid out of instruction and now he's being paid out of athletics again. So he's just <laughs> moving moving the, the position around a little bit based on uh, the current contract. Um, and then really the other reduction in that line has to do with the, um, we have an account called new hires, salary adjustments and changes. And we were able to significantly reduce that one area and that one line item because um, many of our positions that we had money set aside for and contingency were filled. Um, we didn't need as much contingency going into next year because of COVID related positions, because we are getting back to normal now with, um, with COVID. And all the contracts are currently settled. So there wasn't a lot of contingency that needed to be built in to that salary adjustment line for any sort of contractual changes moving forward. So instruction is pretty much staying flat and um, going down, we have our special education budget. So this is including all of our special education teachers, our TAs, uh, clerical that's being paid out of that area. And that is going up slightly. So you, there is a 6.8% increase. And there, there were uh, two additional teachers that were hired um, this year. And there was also a little bit of movement between um, other teachers going from general ed to special ed. But the main reason for the increase for, was really the hiring of the two new teachers, um, really because of student needs. Uh, facilities, that increase is really due to contractual salary and staff increase, increases. Um, supervision and building administration, um, that increase really is um, mostly the one clerical position that we did hire this year. So there was an open clerical position at the elementary school that wasn't filled for over a year. And that was taken out of the budget for uh, the current school year. And that was actually included as one of those new hire, um, as, as part of that contingency and that new hire account code. So we move that money right into the supervision line for that one clerical position. And that's why you see that increase. Um, then the next area after supervision and building administration is central administration. So central administration, there is also a small increase. Oh, bless you. <laughs> the central administration area, which includes district clerk, superintendent's office, and business office. And this is mainly due to, um, we did add the stipend for the substitute district clerk. And um, we also did fill a business office position and there that was open for over a year. And this was also some salary increases that were built in and step increases for clerical positions in that unit. Um, transportation. Transportation is actually decreasing. And the reason why transportation is decreasing is really because the monitor budget has declined sharply. So there were a lot more monitors that were um, working for us at one time, especially during COVID. And we just did not, we don't have the need for as many monitors anymore. So that, that line definitely uh, saw a decrease for that reason. <laughs> Um, athletics, I think we talked about athletics. Uh, we reallocated the AD salary and we also um, added some additional funds for the postseason play in there. And there was also some contractual salary increase built in. Uh, Co-curricular are all the clubs and all the stipends for all the clubs. We had to add some stipends that were not um, aligned with the contract. And there was also a salary 
uh, contractual salary increases included for co-curricular activities. And then central data processing and security, those are very small increases and they really are just based on uh, contractual um, salary increases. There really wasn't any changes to uh, staffing made in those areas. So uh, this is where we stand right now. Um, we are still working on enrollment and scheduling. So if we have any changes to salaries, we're going to be presenting those changes on March 6th. So this is based on all of our current staff and based on our current enrollment and current scheduling. But if something comes up where we feel that um, we need to hire an additional person or we need to start a new, you know, based on scheduling, there needs um, a new program or class, then we'll go ahead and update these numbers for the March 6th. But overall, a 1.35% increase is, we were very, very, um, uh, we were, you know, that was very encouraging considering the increase we we, we saw for employee benefits. Sure. I have a quick question. Um, for the uh, employees and staff who do not have a contractually obligated increase that you built in a contingency, um, can you get back to us on what percentage you used for average for that contingency? Because I know every June we then have to decide as a board yes. what raises we want to give, and then we always are wondering what was the number that was built into the budget. So it'd yes. be nice to have that. Ahead it's of time. been it's been the same for a while, so so we've been using that number. <laughs> okay, if you know, if you happen to know. Yeah, it's great, I mean, but like I said, this um this is this is really like a moving uh these numbers really move a lot. And I have to say, even for the current year, when you look at the budget to actual, you're gonna see that um the actual is gonna be lower just because those five teachers that did retire, you know, we when we were adopted in the current year's budget, we didn't know who was retiring. So those five teachers are included in the current year budget. And basically, um, that's going to be some savings that we have at the end of the year. And at the end of the year, we'll go ahead and we'll move that into um, into one of our reserves. But even for this budget year, I mean, there's there's always going to be a lot of changes that are made after May that aren't going to be incorporated in the actual budget. So but in terms be... in terms of the question, I think just because right, normally you give a 2.5 or 2.8 right. increase so, so it's we'll, good to know what you've actually exactly. budgeted so that yeah we, okay so if you look at if you look at your budget detail you'll see there's two code salary adjustments and new hires and i sort of broke down a little bit of the, the increases in there so but i can well, I mean, we can we can, I get, can go ahead yeah, and yeah just at, you at a future say. date mm -hmm. and then with regard to the next slide jennifer because you're so detail oriented i think for projected employee benefits most of it is pretty flat, except for health insurance um, and your opt out for health insurance. And then there's a reduction in the in the New York State unemployment. So maybe just touch on those three. Yeah. So um, really, employee benefits are increasing by 8%. And um, this is just a little under a million dollars. And this was a much larger increase than we've had to deal with um, in recent years. And the increase is really being driven by the health insurance rate. So when you look at the health insurance line, you'll see a $765,000 change um, just in health insurance. And then you'll see another $108,000 change in the opt-out uh, line because those are actually based on the health insurance rates too. Everything else in the budget is staying um, you know, relatively flat and there's some increases and decreases based on spending. Um, Social Security, of course, did increase slightly because salaries increased slightly. And we're gonna just look at some of the health insurance rates just to show you. I know this is very hard to see. Um, I don't know if anybody has a computer, they could see it on there, but we've had, uh, if you look at family rate, which is the fourth column, We've had double digit increases in the family health insurance rate. I mean, I talk about family because it is the highest rate. It does have the most impact on our budget. And we do have most of our staff covered under that family uh, rate. And you can see last year, we were able to absorb a 12.7% increase in the family rate. And um, this year we're dealing with just under a 15% increase in the family rate. So that family rate went up to $38,110 a year. And this is just for the 2023 calendar year. Um, we don't even know what's going to happen, um, what, how the rate's going to go up for the 2024 calendar rate. So we did we did project another increase in there, 15%, just in case the rates do go up another 15% for um, 2024. 
So for the individual rate uh, for the current year, you'll see that rate went up a little under 12 and a half percent. And also the Medicare rates also went up significantly this year too. Um, last year, we hardly saw any increase in the Medicare rate, but this year we're looking at a 21, 22% increase in the uh, Medicare rate. So this is what really, um, this was the reason for the projected increase in the health insurance budget of 765,000. And the opt-out budget is also increasing because of the rates are going up. So the opt-out budget is basically all of the staff that we, we, we actually pay out some staff members to use either their parent's plan or their spouse plan so that they don't use our plan. So even though it does cost us money for these employees to opt out of our health insurance, um, when you run the numbers, uh, our opt-out right now is 546,000, but if every one of those employees actually opted in, that would run us about 1.7 million. So um, even though it did go up, it's still a savings overall. And our Medicare reimbursement, which is uh, money that we, re um, that we uh, reimburse our retirees for, that's projected to go down slightly. So that budget line is really staying flat. And you expect another increase next year. I mean, it looks fairly rare to have consecutive double-digit increases. It is rare. I mean, if you just look at this, the 20-year look back, and you can yeah. see that um, this is the first time we've had a double-digit increase in two consecutive years. Um, in the past, we've had double digits, and then it would go down okay. slightly, or we kind of see a just the tail of COVID? Or you... This is definitely because yeah. of experience and COVID. And um, so, so this current year, we... Um, when we were budgeting the 22-23 uh, school year, we didn't know what our 23 rates would be. So we actually budgeted a 10% increase. So for the current year, our budget actually is going to be very close just because we budgeted 10% and the rates went up almost 15 million. So for next year, we're actually budgeting a 15% increase. And we're going to hope that the increase is much lower. So we'll, we'll just see. We don't get those rates until November. And um, then we'll know what those with the 2024. But to your point, I suspect though that it's largely uh, related to the, all the money that was printed and then disseminated in our system. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so um, our teacher's retirement system budget is remaining relatively flat, and um, the ERS budget also is slight decline. Um, the teacher's retirement system rate are actually going down slightly. So that's why we only saw a small increase in our budget line. And the employee retirement system, the, the average contribution rate is increasing. So you can see it's going from 11.6 to 13.10, but that's the average over all tiers. So that would be the average over tier four, five, and six. And right now, most of our non-instructional um, staff, they're actually tier six. And the tier six rate is actually much lower than the 13.10. It's around 10.6. Um, actually, it's got 9.5 to 10.6 they're projecting for next year. So since most of our staff are now tier six, we were able to actually reduce that line um, going forward for next year instead of having to see an increase. And really, all of these projections are done by actually projecting every single staff member's um, the salary, multiplying it by the, the, the contribution rate and coming up with the number. So that's why we're able to budget, you know, we, we fine tune these numbers, um, you know, very carefully because we don't want to have a ton of, you know, extra contingency in, in all of these line items. So that's why you'll see all of these odd, odd numbers, you know, such as 6,935 decrease, that one item. Um, and then this is really, Social Security costs, which we discussed, just going up slightly. And unemployment costs, we're reducing that. Um, our unemployment costs, we had during the COVID year, I think it was 1920, we had like a $50,000 expenditure in mm -hmm. unemployment. And then since then, we've seen that number go down significantly. So you can see, um, you know, last year, the number was just uh, 1225 This year, you can see we're at 6,239 now, but um, so for next year, we're thinking that if we reduce it down to 15,000, we, we're still fine, that important. Um, and this is really just a snapshot of all of the individual budget codes for the Board of Ed, district office, business office. This only includes um, equipment and uh, supplies and materials and contractual costs because all the salaries and benefits we already discussed um, in the earlier slide. And this is, 
just a small reduction. Um, we were able to reduce all of these by roughly $5,680. Everything is pretty much staying flat. We went through and saw that nothing really needed to be increased. We reallocated some funds um, from business office contractual to conferences. We decreased the auditing line because uh, we, we really haven't hit that number each year with the internal audits and the external audits. And we were actually uh, had to increase our district wide insurance. So we heard from NYSTER that our insurance rate is probably going to go up anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. But when we looked at how much we actually had budgeted this year compared to what we've been spending in the previous years, we felt that if we increase the budget by five thousand dollars, we'll we'll still be able to um, absorb that 10 to 15 percent increase. And next year for the 24 25 budget, we might have to actually um, increase that even further depending on how the rates go going forward. But everything else is pretty much staying flat in those areas. Um, and debt service and transfers to other funds. So we have a huge increase in, this, in the one area of TAN interest. So um, I, I discuss this uh, every year that we have to borrow a tax anticipation note because our school year begins on July 1st and we have to start paying bills on July 1st, but we don't receive our tax levy money until January. So everyone pays their first tax bill in December, by the time the town sends us the, or actually by January, and then they send us the money uh, from January to June. So we borrow to pay our bills for those first six months and for cash flow purposes. So you can see what's been going on with the interest rates um, on the bottom of the schedule. I had to increase that budget by $150,000. So my current year budget for TAN interest was $150,000 on a $9 million borrowing. And next year, I'm increasing that to $300,000. And on the bottom, you can see that historically, um, we had borrowed $15 million in 1920, $13 million in 2021, and then $9 million for the um, last year and $9 million for the current year. And our term, we actually decreased the term of the borrowing even um, further just so that we could save some money on the interest. And when you look at um, what we budgeted and you look at the actual interest cost, you can see the, the change. Um, the interest rates have gone through the roof. Uh, they're continuing to increase. We were told that um, our credit rating actually was saved us almost $100,000 because um, even at the 3.5% net interest rate, we were told that it would actually, we, some districts were having to pay um, just under 5% or 4.5% for the, the same amount of money. So um, our interest went from 253 um, down to 120, down to 84. Now it's back up to 277. So, and this is why this is why we had to increase this budget line significantly. Um, we're gonna just keep hold uh, next year. We're gonna see how our cash flow is. We're gonna see whether or not we need to borrow 9 million. Hopefully if we could bring that down a little bit and we could even decrease the term even further. We may be able to save money um, that way going forward. Uh, transfer to lunch fund is staying the same. We're not making any changes. The lunch fund um, did expand their program this year, so they did bring in some additional funds. It's a little, um, you know, we're always having staffing issues with the lunch fund just because we have a set number of staff and we did grow the program, but we didn't, we weren't able to hire any additional staff to support that program. So um, staffing is always an issue. Uh, we're still looking to hire additional staff if anyone's interested, also bus drivers. But um, the lunch fund did much better last year than they've done in previous years. So we were able to keep this in line. Um, we were able to just leave it alone and, and leave it flat. <clears throat> the transfer to special aid fund, you'll see an increase. So the current year budget, this transfer to special aid fund is actually supports our summer school handicap program. So we have a summer school program um, for our special ed students, and we provide um, basically transportation, we provide um, education, we provide related services. So, and we do receive state aid for that program. But as the program costs are increasing, um, we are having to increase this budget line. So you can see um, in 2021, this was the COVID year, so we didn't have um, a regular program. So our cost that year uh, was, was 58,000. So during the summer of 21, you can see the expenditures went up to 92,000 and our budget was 70,000. This year, we actually left the budget flat at 70,000. We know that we're probably gonna need additional funds by the end of the year. 
And um, we're still waiting on some bills from both seeds to determine the exact amount. But next year, we definitely know we're going to need additional money to support the program. So we did have to increase that line by 40000 um, so that we don't come up short two years in a row. Uh, the transfer to debt service, this is not changing hardly at all. So you have a small dollar change, um, 2649 uh, This is all, for all of the bonds that are currently outstanding. Um, we are not really going to see a, a, a change to the debt service bond payments really until 2035. So this is going to pretty much stay the same up until that point. Um, and it doesn't look like we're going to be refinancing or refunding anytime soon since the rates that we have currently are so much better than what's out there. Uh, transfer to capital fund. Um, we haven't had a transfer to capital funds in a few years, but um, this two, this 2.5 million, this actually wasn't included in the budget. This was pro the proposition for the HPAC. So that wasn't really a budgeted item, but you'll see it in there as an expenditure because that was the 2.5 million um, just reallocated from the capital reserve. It had to get accounting-wise, it gets sent to the general fund, and the general fund sends it back to the capital fund. That's why you see it in there as an expenditure. But the money is sitting in the capital fund. It's not actually spent. But um, this year, we're actually going to try to address some of the health and safety items on our uh, visual building inspection report. So we are going to talk further about this transfer capital line at our next meeting on February 6th when we go through the facilities budget. And we're going to see how much the um, budget would be able to absorb. And we'll um, try and include some, some capital items to that area. And the next slide is just um, summarizing the calendar. And uh, on February 6th, we're going to start talking about our revenue projection. We think that we are going to have some increases on the revenue side um, and our tax levy limit. We have most of the numbers that, um, that we need for that calculation. We're going to review the technology budget in detail. Uh, we're also going to talk about setting up that technology reserve, which would be a separate proposition in May to pay for technology related capital improvements, equipment and security um, it's, and security improvements throughout the district. We're also going to be going through our transportation budget and our facilities budget on February 6th. So um, if anybody has any questions or would like any additional information, um, let me know. I'll find out that the one question that Jordana had. Does anybody have any questions for the grandmother? No. I'll try now. We're good. No, for now. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, if you no know, questions on the budget presentation, uh, may I have a motion for consent agenda items 7.2? Through 7.11. So moved. Second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay. If we feel voting. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, the bank It's okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Oh, she's got it. We're good. Yay. Everybody voted? Mm -hmm. I'm a yes. Oh, she's not. Okay. Brian's not up. Okay. Okay. So that's unanimous. Um, do we have any items for discussion? Anyone? No? No. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on then to public input number two. Same rules that were discussed for public input one um, are um, also for public input two. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to speak, please go up to the podium, sign your name on the paper, print your name on the paper, please. Okay. Okay. Nobody online. Okay. So that concludes public input number two. Two. So may I have a motion to convene into executive session to discuss contracts? So check it. If you want to open up the voting? Yeah. Alex yes. obviously is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Once we uh, come out of executive session, no further action will be taken. The meeting will just close.
Thank you all. Give me that part. Again. All right. All right.